My fellow humans, today is one of the greatest days ever. Indeed, it is the day when we cover the interstellar medium. Now, some people may claim that this is better described as the interstellar tedium, but those people are wrong. And we will today discuss the beginnings of a wonderful journey through the study of how gas behaves in a galaxy. So uh, the way we want to get a, a handle on the interstellar medium is to think about the ISM in the context of a galaxy. The ISM is everything that's basically not stars and not dark matter. So formally, we chunk a bunch of stuff in here like gas, cosmic rays, magnetic fields, all the dust in the galaxy. But mostly what we care about is the gas. And so what we're going to be looking at today uh, is really focusing on the chemical state of the matter that we describe in terms of what hydrogen is doing. So when we talk about the ISM, the vocabulary we use is just what is the chemistry of hydrogen? Is it ionized, neutral, or molecular? So ionized is H+, plus, uh, H neutral hydrogen, ordinary isolated hydrogen atoms, those are neutral, and then molecular is H+. Uh, uh, to the molecule. Now, because astronomers are interesting people, uh, we often uh, will combine uh, this with the spectroscopic notation that we learned back in this discussion of stars, where ionized hydrogen would be referred to as H Roman numeral 2, which refers to the second ionization stage of hydrogen. And this makes sense because uh, it's H2. H1 is neutral hydrogen because that's the first ionization state. And then the molecular gas, of course, is H2, which is the same thing we used for the ionized gas. And this is never, ever confusing. Uh, so normally uh, we will just fall, default to saying ionized versus molecular in cases where we have to uh, disambiguate. So. Uh, the ISM in the galaxy is broadly classified into phases, though the boundaries between these phases are uh, not uniquely well described. So uh, the hot, uh, we generally talk about them in terms of their temperature and the chemical state of the hydrogen. And so as an example, the hot ionized medium is gas that is hot, so typically temperatures of a million Kelvin, and ionized, uh, so... This is a plasma. Uh, and then the warm ionized medium is cooler than the hot ionized medium. The warm neutral medium is neutral gas that's about the same temperature of 10,000 Kelvin as the ionized gas. Uh, then we have the cool neutral medium, which is a few thousand Kelvin uh, or lower, down to about 100 Kelvin. And then the cold molecular medium, which is temperatures typically mm, about 10 Kelvin. And what's neat about the, this is if you look at the typical densities of the state, uh, they go in the opposite direction. The hot ionized medium is the lowest density gas, and the cold molecular medium is the highest density gas. And you'll notice that the way this is sort of set up is that the product of the density times the temperature, which is the pressure, is about equal across all of these phases of the ISM. So the ISM can change its temperature and its ionization state, but is roughly in pressure balance, or at least what we like to think of it as energy equipartition. Each phase has kind of the same amount of kinetic energy volume density. Now to give you a sense of what this all looks like, let's watch a movie. Uh, this is a movie from uh, the Silk Collaboration, which is a high-resolution simulation of what the interstellar medium looks like uh, through the galaxy. And so the Silk Project has kindly provided this movie. And let's take a wa uh, watch through. I'm going to stop it right away and talk about things. These are a, col a cubicle column through the galaxy. And in the middle is a layer of gas. Uh, and then stuff is going to happen in that layer. The bottom panel shows the top-down view of that box. And they're about 500 parsecs across. And then the vertical scale is uh, thousands of parsecs, a couple thousand parsecs. 
So this is a slice through the, ver like basically taking a core section through the plane of the galaxy. That's, here's the mid plane. And then this is the top down view. Each of these panels shows you a different view of uh, what uh, uh, one of the variables in the galaxy. This is a numerical simulation, so they are just simulating the process of physics over the course of time uh, on a big supercomputer, which is why it's all funky colors. The color bars at the bottom underneath the movie bar uh, indicate where which values are low and high. And so what we see here is these are density plot, uh, temperature, this is the column density, so it's the total column all the way through the volume. Uh, and then this is the uh, densities of the ionized, neutral, molecular gas. And for reasons that we'll discuss a little later, we show carbon monoxide because that's the best tracer of H2 we have observationally. Okay, uh, so let's just watch the movie for a bit. And what makes the Silk Project interesting is it has star formation in it, and with that star formation, it has supernova explosions. And those supernova explosions blow up in the interstellar medium, and they cause a flow of material up. And then the gravity of the galaxy sort of will pull it down. And what you can see is the gas in uh, the midplane eventually gets kind of disrupted and converted into molecular gas. but Let's go back to the beginning and sort of watch this carving up again. And you can see all of these uh, shock waves. It's kind of neat what's happening is that the gas is carving out large cavities. It turns out these are very high temperature. See the high temperature here? Very low density uh, cavities. And that's what the uh, supernova explosions are doing. And then the clouds of the cold molecular and atomic gas just kind of take it. Notice that they're evolving much more slowly, much slower than the uh, stuff inside the low density ionized shock fronts. So you see these small clouds tend to form where the supernova are going off in the volume in between and stirring up the gas. So you see all of these shells and then the uh, the colder faces the ISM just kind of sit there and take it. The shock waves kind of wrap around them and the material kind of protects what's happening inside it. So it's a wonderful movie. Uh, there, thanks very much for the Silk collaboration for making it available to us. So here's a slice through that. I've taken one of their simulation volumes and kind of re-rendered it uh, here. Uh, this is showing a top-down view of the ISM. Uh, in density, the um, unit here is hydrogen nuclear density, and then the other one here is the temperature, where blue is cold and red is hot, because, you know, that's what our kitchen taps say. Anyways, uh, and so that's sort of more intuitively human uh, for us. Uh, but uh, what we see is we see this large cloud of cold gas stretched across here with all this interesting substructure. And then we see all of this kind of red uh, stuff here. This is where the supernova explosion are going off. And indeed, this round thing right here is a big old supernova explosion that's setting off. So we have the interstellar medium is just kind of a mess. We're going to take the same thing now and sort of look at it on a slice vertically. That's shown here. And we see the same cavities. Here's that big old supernova explosion again, uh, shown, is that the right one? I think, yeah, that's the right one. Uh, shown here, it's a couple, uh, you know, 150 parsecs above the midplane of the galaxy, and then this cold gas. And these supernova explosions are driving material up vertically out of the plane of the galaxy, leaving behind clouds of cold material, which is what the stars form. So, how could this be tedious? This is a fantastic, wonderful train wreck of uh, all kinds of physics that are going on. And the study of the interstellar medium is challenging. So we need to just have a few principles and dive into a few particular cases that we'd like to understand in the context of this class. So the key properties of the ISM that we want to keep in mind through all of this is first, that the ISM is dynamic. 
It is not a steady state system. It is an equilibrium system uh, where things are moving into and out of phases and changing where their positions are so that on average, a galaxy has a common set of ISM properties. But an individual parcel of gas or a region within a galaxy changes dramatically over its lifespan. So it's dynamic. The ISM is in rough equipartition. And so this means that the different phases of the gas and the different parts of the galaxy have a balance of energy and momentum flow. So if we look at a region, we tend to see over large enough scales, we see the energy moving out of and into that region is about the same. Again, on average, uh, with a little net flow. So it's an equipartition. And the important thing, the reason why we have to bring the ISM, this complicated beast, into our study of galaxies is that the ISM is the exchange for matter and energy uh, in the galaxy. It is where material comes in from out of the galaxy, gets built into stars, how stars explode and dump their energy and their momentum uh, out or their radiation out. And it's the ISM is the thing that changes and exchanges all of that stuff. So it's important that we understand the ISM because we can't understand the galaxy without it. And so we're going to study a few case studies. Uh, we're going to first study the ideas of how radiation gets reprocessed by the interstellar medium. Uh, we're next going to study how matter flows through the galaxy a little bit, do a couple of studies. And then we are going to study how the ISM maintains its different phases through a balance of heating and cooling. So these are case studies, not an actual example of how the whole ISM fits together. Trust me, I can teach an entire graduate school class on that, and I would love to do so. But we're going to really focus on these three cases just as exemplars of these three properties. And then we'll kind of illustrate a cartoon at, uh, next week to sort of say, here's how we should think about the ISM in galaxies as a whole. So um, the first thing that I want to talk about is the reprocessing of radiation in the context of uh, what we call an H2 region. Notice that the H2 is the spectroscopic 2, so this is ionized gas. And the example that we give here is what happens when we set off a high mass star and we just sort of leave it to go in the middle of a cloud of neutral gas. Well, that high mass star produces tons of photons that are ionizing, so above 13.6 electron volts in energy, uh, and so that means that they can photoionize the hydrogen around them. But this region is going to be in equipartition. It's going to be in time balance, so uh, a uh, steady state. And so that ionization of the star is going to be balanced by recombination where a proton and an electron are going to get together and they're going to re-release photons as they come together into an atom. We want to understand this type of system. Uh, the picture here shows a H2 region in another galaxy, and you can see the high mass stars down here in the region. And then these shells that you see around it are the wisps of gas and light that are um, the wisps of gas that are traced by the light they emit from reprocessing radiation. Okay, uh, so let's dive into the physics of this a little more detail. We can think about this in the context of our favorite thing, the Bohr atom. Oh, cake is the favorite thing, but the second favorite thing is the Bohr atom. Um, and so uh, the Bohr atom has, in physics speak, energy levels that are the, bi ion the binding energy of hydrogen, 13.6 eV, over n, the principal quantum number, squared. And it's negative because we always define energy equals zero at uh, the in n equals infinity state. So that's the free state. And so bound systems are negative, so 13.6 eV. And we know all about the photons uh, that interact here from our studies of modern physics. And so if a electron drops from uh, one of these top states, like n equals 5, down to n equals 1, we say that that's a photon that's in the Lyman series of photons. And if we drop down from a state down into the n equals 2 state, why, that's a Balmer series of photons. And so the line that we call that is H alpha, 
whereas uh, the, we call Lyman alpha, Lyman beta, Lyman gamma to be n equals two and, uh, or two to one, three to one, and four to one lines of hydrogen respectively. H alpha is the three to two line. H beta or Balmer beta is the four to two. Uh, five to two is the um, uh, five to two is the um, uh, H gamma, uh, etc. And then the next series up, ending in n equals three state, are the passion series. And then there's bracket and fund, and then they stop naming. Them. I think there's a couple more, and then they stop naming them. Anyways, uh, when we look out at space, we often see these. These are the optical lines. Uh, H alpha has a wavelength of 656 nanometers. It's a bright red line. Uh, H beta is 486.1 nanometers, which is a nice blue line. And then these are uh, also blue. So uh, we have all of these lines in the electronic structure of hydrogen. And we want to think about what happens under the process of recombination. So what happens is a photon with an energy level uh, above 13.6 eV uh, are going to ionize a photon to the continuum. Uh, so Lyman continuum photons uh, are those photons that can start at the n equals 1 state, the ground state of hydrogen, and rip the, photon, the electron off of the atom and send it off uh, ionized. So those are called the Lyman continuum. They have wavelengths shorter than 91.2 nanometers. Um, those that uh, equality sign is backwards. That should be less than. Um, similarly, if a hydrogen for some reason is sitting in the uh, n equals 2 state, then a photon with a wavelength less than 365 nanometers can come along and energize that photon into the Balmer continuum. And so these Balmer uh, into the continuum. And so these photons are said to be the Balmer continuum. Uh, so again, equality signs backwards. All right. So what we want to do is we want to think about the picture of what happens when a star ionizes a bunch of this pure hydrogen gas. And so we set up a cartoon like this, and we're going to calculate something that we call the Stromgren sphere. So it's the size of the region that a star can keep ionized. And so inside this Stromgren sphere, uh, it has a radius of Rs. This nice big blue star is ionizing a bunch of hydrogen atoms. But those hydrogen atoms undergo recombination. And so they recombine back down to form neutral gas. And they do that on some characteristic timescale that we will study. And uh, what we're going to find out is that the Stromgren sphere is basically the largest region that that star can maintain the ionized region around it. So we get this nice uh, little spherical shell. So it's a three-dimensional uh, cloud with a gas. How big is that? Well, let's find out. So the things that we need to know to calculate the Stromgren radius, which is the radius of that sphere, is how many photons does this star produce per uh, second? That's the ionizing photons, which you did a homework problem on. Set up and cash that check right here. Uh, the other thing is that we need to know the density of the hydrogen nuclei. We're going to bookkeep everything in terms of the proton, not whether the electrons attach to it or not. Uh, but we're going to assume a pure hydrogen atom, and we're going to bookkeep everything in terms of the hydrogen nuclei, which are just the protons. We're going to make some assumptions. We're going to say this is a steady state scenario. Uh, we're spherical, uniform density, and we're going to assume it's hydrogen, uh, completely hydrogen, so that the electron density in the region is equal to the hydrogen density. And if you set all that up, you can go into the wonders of a book about uh, the interstellar medium, and you can find that the number of ionizing photons has to be equal to the number of recombinations. And so this is just an equilibrium state, is that every photon that leaves the star eventually gets absorbed by one hydrogen atom somewhere within the Stromgren sphere. And so that means that if there are a certain number of recombinations per second, call it Q, Q rec, then that has to be exactly balanced by the number of photons produced by the star. Uh, so the, then we end up in a st steady state. If there are more photons than recombinations, the sphere will expand. 
And similarly, if there are more recombinations, then the sphere will get smaller. Now, what we get out of atomic physics is that the number of recombinations per unit time, per unit volume, is some function, alpha t, times the hydrogen nuclear den nuclei density, that's the protons, times the electron density. And this makes sense. This essentially, we see this kind of rate equation throughout this chapter, which says it depends on how many hydrogen atoms you, or how many protons you have, how many electrons you have. So it depends on the product of both of those, because if we have a bunch of protons, but not enough electrons, then we're not going to get a lot of recombinations. Uh, so if those two are uh, those two factors, so we get the product of those two densities, and then we multiply it by something that comes out of atomic physics, which basically tracks how the uh, how likely it is under a given uh, set of circumstances, uh, under a given uh, uh, temperature regime, for a electron to sail past a proton and get caught up and turned into a hydrogen atom. And that has a functional form of 2.54 times 10 to the minus 19 uh, meter cubed per second. And then there's a weak temperature dependence normalized to the characteristic temperature of a region, 10,000 Kelvin. So anyways, hotter gases, uh, the electrons are moving faster and therefore they have less time to recombine as they whip by a proton. And so we end up sort of seeing that as a uh, decrease in the effectiveness of the recombination. Uh, okay, now I want you to pay attention to the units here, meter cubed per second. And what you'll notice is that when I multiply it by a per meter cubed, per meter cubed number densities, this becomes the desired units. Recombination per volume per, uh, sorry, recombinations per time per volume. So you'll get an answer of per meter cubed per second. Uh, and so we have this sort of weird units that essentially cancels out these two terms of density to give us a volumetric rate of recombination. Okay, so then we do the straightforward thing, which is to essentially say, well, let's balance these two. We set the ionizing photons to be uh, the total number, or sorry, the re total number of recombinations with his recombinations per time, per, uh, yeah, per time, per volume. That's the alpha NHNE term. Then we multiply by the total volume to get the total number of recombinations per second. So that's the four pi RS cubed uh, at, over three. And so we multiply the total volume, volumes per uh, recombination per second per volume, and equate that to the number of ionization uh, photons produced per second. So both of these are per second, and we balance out and solve for the size of the Strombin sphere. Three Q naught over four pi alpha NH squared. And we've made the assumption that NH equals NE. And so we do this and we find for a typical star, oh, and then there's a cube root. And we find for a typical star that that's a few parsecs uh, live. So that's the region that you recombine. So that gives us uh, a bit of an insight as to what's going on. So uh, the next thing we can do is sort of trot out this kind of physics to explore some other topics. Okay, so what we'd like to do is actually apply this formula in a different context. So we got our strong grand sphere formula, and here what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually calculate, uh, show how we can use this recombination coefficient to calculate a different relationship. Uh, and so the example basically asks, if we shut off that ionizing star, how long would it take for this region to recombine into neutral hydrogen gas? And so the way we're going to set this up is we're going to say, okay, if NH is going to count as my ions here, uh, what I'll do is I'm going to basically say, well, what this is, is this is actually a differential equation. D NH DT is going to be negative alpha of T uh, times NH times NE. The, which basically says the rate at which my ions are disappearing is going to be negative alpha times NH times NE, and that's the recombination rate per unit volume. This is the, uh, so recombination rate per unit volume. Uh, this is the, uh, the ion 
uh, abundance times uh, divided by uh, or change with respect to time. Okay, but you know, differential equations are mm, less than exciting. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say I'm going to care about this as a linear approximation. And I'm going to say at the, I'm going to do the final minus the initial, which is going to be my ion abundance is zero at the final step minus the initial, which is NH. And then my final is going to be the recombination time is however long that takes minus zero. This is not a linear equation, but we're approximating it as that because, you know, asterisk, uh, alpha T NH times NE. And so then uh, we get this as negative NH over T rec is equal to minus alpha T of T times NH times NE. And then what we'll do is we'll solve for the recombination time. So the recombination time in this formalism is NH over alpha NH times NE. The NHs will cancel. And so I get this is one over alpha times NE which, because we are assuming hydrogen is, is pure hydrogen nebula, is alpha times the NH given in the problem. Okay, that's cool. So let's assume T equals 10 to the 4 Kelvin for this particular problem. And then we will go ahead and stick this value in and get the recombination time, T rec, is, um, I'm going to write as an inverse, 2.54 times 10 to the minus 19 meter cubed per second times uh, the NH, which is 10 to the 6 per meter cubed, all to the minus 1 power. That was the 1 over there. And if I do that, I get a value of 3.94 times 10 to the 12 seconds, which, of course, everybody knows as one year is 3.16 times 10 to the 7 seconds. And that comes out to be about 1.2 times 10 to the 5 years. Certainly not instantaneous, but compared to like stellar life si lifespans, pretty short. Even the high mass stars have a lifespan of about 3 million years. And so this will shut off in 5% of a high mass star's life. So they'll ionize this region, keep it going, and then it will fade away comparatively quickly on the interstellar medium scale. Okay, the main purpose for doing that is to kind of illustrate this characteristic time scale argument, which we get to uh, right, right here. That's the crux of it. A linear approximation to a complicated differential equation. It's good and establishes a characteristic time. We use this kind of reasoning a lot as we go forward. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about here is how what we're seeing is fundamentally a reprocessing of radiation field. These high energy photons are coming boiling out of the star and then the interstellar medium gas absorbs those and ionizes and then recombines them. So the photon phases uh, or states, I don't know, but photon fates. I was sorry, I was being clever. So this is what happens to the fates of the photons. Uh, as they come uh, uh, through here. So what happens uh, if the, um, uh, what happens to the photons that are actually produced during the recombination? So we have an electron up here and then it recombines into one of these uh, states. And it can, re so we come along and most hydrogen hangs out in the ground state. A photon comes along, ionizes it, and kicks it out into the continuum. Now, when that electron comes back and recombines with the proton to create a hydrogen atom, it can recombine into the ground state. And if it does so, it just creates another ionizing Lyman continuum photon, which goes off and ionizes something else. But it can also recombine into the n equals 2 state, or the n equals 5 state, or something like that. And they'll recombine usually into the outer uh, energy states of the hydrogen atom. And then it will go undergo radiative de-excitation, and it will drop down, the electron will drop down to the ground state, giving off a series of photons as it goes. 
And so uh, it's kind of interesting because if we come here and we recombine straight into the n equals one, makes another ionizing photon. But if we come down to like n equals three and then go from n equals three to one, uh, we end up um, creating a photon that is going to go around, hit another hydrogen in the ground state, and raise it up to the n equals three state and then it can go back down to ground, or it could break that up into a Balmer series photon and drop down and create a H alpha. And then what's left is, so all of these photons end up kind of, if they recombine into anything but the N equals one state, you tend to break up the energy from an ionizing photon into lower energy photons, be they in the Balmer, the Passion, the Fun series, whatever. What they're going to do is they're going to actually reprocess the ionizing photon into essentially a Lyman photon plus other energy that can leave the H2 region. It's optical emission or infrared emission and just flows out because if it sees a photon in the ground state, it will not ionize it. And indeed, under interstellar conditions, most of the uh, hydrogen drops down into the ground state and is hanging out there. So most of the stuff is in the ground state when these photons are moving through the H2 region for all of the neutral atoms. So this, when we take a step back, is an example of reprocessing radiation. H2 regions are taking ionizing photons, stuff above 13.6 eV, and turning it into lower energy photons. And then if you pay attention, you'll notice that anything from the two to one state is just going to excite up to the uh, n equals two and then back down to the one, n equals two and back down to the one. So these Lyman alpha photons are also uh, sort of left over and they kind of leak gently out of the H2 region uh, here. But on average, all of these photons get turned into stuff in the Balmer, Passion, etc. series, plus a single Lyman alpha photon. So it's neat. We've basically gotten rid of an ionizing photon and reprocessed it down into optical radiation plus a Lyman alpha photon. Well, we've already seen an example of reprocessing radiation in the interstellar medium. Uh, and that comes from dust. And we've made a huge stink of this in the terms of extinction, but we also can kind of understand it in terms of re-radiation. So you'll recall that uh, dust is also reprocessing light from short wavelength to long wavelength. And then there's this distribution of uh, grain sizes where the number at a given radius goes like R to the minus 3.5. So it looks a lot like an IMF. It's kind of the similar construction, except it has a steeper index. And uh, most of the absorption from the interstellar medium is done by the small grains. And I want to take a moment here and sort of comment on how it's actually uh, doing that. Uh, here, uh, because we made a little bit of a comment about what is the cross-section of the uh, dust grain. We said, oh, it changes as a function of wavelength, but we didn't really go into the physics of it too, too much. And so what this is, is a nice dive into the uh, uh, feature, which is comparing the wavelength of the light relative to the size of the dust grains uh, for a typical uh, size dust grain. And so this is showing different regimes where we have the short wavelength light, uh, medium wavelength light and long wavelength light compared to the size of the dust. And what we're showing here is what we call the efficiency. And the efficiency is the scattering, or is, this, is the cross section for this optical interaction relative to the geometric cross section. So one, which is where stuff starts out, is essentially it behaves like a solid object. And for small photons compared to the size of a dust grain, which is here about 0.2 uh, microns, uh, it just acts like a solid object and has the geometrical cross section. And this is showing the scattering and the absorption cross sections. Uh, so the blue curve shows how the light gets scattered. And then the red curve is how the dust grain absorbs the light and then re-radiates it. 
And what you see is that they, uh, a lot of physicists have operated down here where the wavelength of the light is very long compared to the size of the particle. This is called the Rayleigh regime, and that has the scattering cross-section of 1 over lambda to the fourth. And we will say, oh, it's blue skies. That's amazing. Uh, because the air particles... Uh, are a few, you know, are nano, sub nanometer size, you know, a nitrogen molecule. And the uh, wavelength of the light that's being scattered is a hundred, is a thousand times larger uh, than that. So we're in the Rayleigh regime where scattering efficiency is dropping like lambda to the fourth and the absorption is dropping like one over lambda squared. Uh, for short, short wavelength light, it acts just like a solid target. Geometric cross-section equals the uh, absorption cross-section. And then there's this intermediate regime that we call the Mi uh, scattering regime, uh, which is kind of where the wavelength of the light is kind of comparable to, but slightly larger than the grain. And it's neat to note that uh, if you're a physicist and have thought a lot about this, there's actually a continuum of scattering regimes uh, between these two. So uh, really grateful for this wonderful review by Galliano that had this gorgeous diagram uh, showing this. Okay, so that's another example we've seen of light being reprocessed by uh, the interstellar medium. Uh, in this case, it's the dust that's embedded in the interstellar medium. And we saw a graph like this earlier that we can essentially take the SED of a stellar population, absorb it in the optical, and that light pops back out in the mid and the far infrared. Uh, we note that dust is a relatively poor emitter at long wavelength radiation compared to its size. It's out here in the, um, uh, the sort of absorption and re-radiation uh, regime, this sort of Rayleigh regime for long wavelength light. Uh, and so it follows a Stefan Boltzmann like radi uh, 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 Stefan Boltzmann like radiation law, uh, where the luminosity of a dust grain is proportional to temperature to the fourth, except we have to tack on this extra factor to account for how the cro absorption cross section is changing, which is minus two out here in this regime. And so we tend to actually see that the um, cross section is going like, uh, uh, the luminosity goes like temperature to the sixth power uh, for dust grains, mostly because as they get hotter, it shifts the peak of the black body into the regime where the dust is more efficient at radiating, and this leads to a higher, uh, a faster rise in the luminosity. Okay, so again, main thing that we care about the interstellar medium do is reprocessing radiation. And so we see that here's this lovely galaxy where we have the optical radiation here. This is M81. Uh, uh, the optical radiation here is getting reprocessed into the infrared light. And we saw that back in chapter two as well. Okay, uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is what is setting the temperature of the ISM. And we're going to come back to heating and cooling a lot next week. But right now, uh, I'll just note that the typical temperature of an H2 region is about 8 to 12,000 Kelvin, and we'd like to understand what sets this temperature. Let's put a pin in this, but the thing I want to understand, remind you of right now is the idea that the, if we have a temperature, the, that's really a statement of the kinetic energy of the particles. And so on a per particle basis, when we say the temperature is 10,000 Kelvin, that means 3 halves kT, where this is the Boltzmann K, is equal to 1 half mv squared, again, on a per particle basis. And so this means I want to know how fast are protons moving on average in an ionized gas region. And so uh, we can actually calculate that out. So let's... Uh, set up our uh, slides to do that and actually remember to switch. Okay, uh, so what we're going to say is that in this region, we have one half mv squared is equal to three halves kT. And so what we're going to do is uh, we want to use the temperature T and we're going to use the properties of a hydrogen particle, the proton, uh, which has this mass right here. Okay, 
Uh, so we're going to actually solve for v here, which is uh, cancel the 2. And so v is equal to root 3kt over m. So then this is going to go like uh, 3 times 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin times the 8,000 Kelvin that I'm assuming in this problem. And I'm going to divide that by the 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms and take the square root of the whole thing and that's going to give me uh, 1.4 times 10 to the 4 meters per second or about 14 kilometers per second which is uh, pretty fast. Now this is closely related to whoops let's do that to the sound speed and so we're going to use in this class uh, we're going to use a couple different types of sound speeds, but I want to familiarize yourself with the isothermal sound speed is root kT over m. And the difference between these is a factor of 3. And that 3 is what comes from the three different dimensions in the velocity dispersion. And so since sound waves are really only moving in one direction, we only consider one dimension for the motion of the sound wave whereas 3 is what we care about for the typical total velocity. So we pick up that extra 3 from uh, the dimension. Okay. So I wanted to remind you of sound speeds and its relationship to temperatures here, because the next thing we need to talk about is how matter flows through uh, the interstellar medium. And so the... Oh, you need to see that. Uh, yeah. Hmm? how matter flows through the interstellar medium. And uh, this, we're going to use a case study of a supernova explosion. So a supernova explosion uh, is what happens when a star suddenly decides to jump 10 to the 44 joules of energy into the, inter into the gas around it. Uh, when this happens, uh, the explosion has a typical uh, speed of launch of something like 3 times 10 to the 4 kilometers per second. Uh, or 0.1c. And we just calculated the typical speed of sound in the interstellar medium of about 8 kilometers per second. That's the 14 divided by a root 3 uh, that we saw on the last slide. So this is a heavily supersonic flow of material. This is an example of the shockwave around supernova 1054, uh, which was the historical supernova observed in year 1054. This is the Crab um, supernova remnant, or also known as M1 in our own galaxy. For this, we're actually going to be using the adiabatic sound speed as a reference. So the adiabatic sound speed, I showed you the isothermal sound speed last time, uh, or two slides ago. The adiabatic sound speed is uh, relevant because that's the if the gas doesn't lose any energy when it's compressed, then we use uh, this. And the shockwave happens so fast that the oh, we need to compare things to adiabatic uh, uh, the propagation time for adiabatic uh, fluid flows through the ISM. Uh, we use the interstellar medium as an isothermal sound wave with gamma equals one earlier because often the sound waves the heating and cooling times are relatively short compared to the sound crossing time of the system. More on that next week. Anyways, uh, so. What we do in comparing these flows is we actually construct something called the Mach number, which is the speed of the flow relative to the sound speed. And the sound speed is really the speed at which pressure waves move through the ISM. And the pressure waves are the way that a gas communicates, hey, there's something coming, get out of the way. So the very act of uh, sort of pushing through, you know, the atmosphere here on Earth, when you're walking into the air, the air gets out of your way and the air communicates the, to itself that you are coming through pressure waves. You walk into it, it pushes that a little bit, and then the uh, displacement moves out at the adiabatic sound speed. When you're a shock wave, you're moving way faster. Well, not you personally, but when the supernova shock dumps into the interstellar medium, it is moving way faster 
then the gas has any time to uh, indicate that there's something coming down uh, the pipe. And so what this means is we have gas moves into what's called a shock. And a shock is a discontinuity in the properties of a fluid. Uh, so formally, you see a step function in, say, the densities of the fluid flow. And so when we have these shock waves uh, blasting through the interstellar medium, they tend to get really thin because there's no sort of time for the sound waves to spread out that material in any ways. Nope, they are razor thin shocks as they propagate into the interstellar medium. So we, we want to do is sort of understand a bit about how those shocks flow. And we're going to set up a classic interstellar medium galactic physics problem called the set-off solution to describe how this supernova shock front expands. And we're going to imagine this as a spherical explosion, and it's going to set off a shock wave here. And we're going to describe it in terms of the radius r and how that increases with time. So it's going to move outward as a function of time into some ambient gas with a density of uh, rho naught. OK, so there's two phases that we want to consider for a supernova shock front blasting into the interstellar medium. During the first phase, uh, the adiabatic, uh, we call it the adiabatic phase, and the supernova here conserves energy. So the total kinetic energy of all of the gas in the front is conserved. Uh, so stuff flows into and gets gathered up in the shock front, and so it increases the mass, and since the energy is conserved, this must slow things down. We move into something a little later called the snowplow phase, and that's what happens when the gas is around long enough for cooling to become important. And so then it starts losing energy and only the continued momentum of the shock front carries it forward. And our goal is to calculate the speed at which this shock front moves into the interstellar medium, and which we'll call four pa, uh, we'll call, sorry, V of T, which is the time derivative dr by dt. Okay. So uh, let's start out with the first part of the set-off solution, which is the adiabatic phase. And we're going to assume that this E supernova is converted into kinetic energy purely, and then it, this kinetic energy of the shock front is conserved as it increases material. We're going to start out very small compared to the size of the shock front. And th so all of the mass inside the ISM is just going to be of ISM in the shock front is going to not be dominated by the stuff from the star, but by the gas that it gathers up. And the amount that it gathers up is essentially the amount of material that should be inside this sphere of radius r. So that's 4 third pi r cubed times the mass density of the material before it got swept up, which is rho naught. The energy of the supernova is 1 half mv squared. And then what we can do is we can write down, plug m into the energy of the supernova and get that this is e supernova is 2 pi rho naught over 3 r cubed dr by dt squared. That's the mv squared, which is 100% a solvable differential equation. So let's solve it. All right. Uh, so we want to solve for what R and what V are for this uh, supernova explosion. And so what we can do is we'll isolate all of this and turn this into, or we'll isolate uh, the variables, which is basically R cubed times dr by dt squared. And then we'll push all the constants to the other side. This is equal to 3 energy of the supernova over 2 pi row naught. Okay, so far so good. This is a good uh, case where we're going to just try a solution. Uh, we're going to try a solution of r of t is equal to b times t to the alpha, which has the limit that as t goes to zero, r goes to zero, so I don't need like a constant term. I'm just going to directly substitute this in here, and then dr by dt is going to be b alpha t to the alpha minus 1. OK, so let's plug these in. So we get uh, b cubed t to the 3 alpha from the r cubed term. And then we're going to get b squared alpha squared 
t to the 2 alpha minus 2, that's the dr by dt quantity squared term, and then that's equal to 3e supernova over 2 pi rho naught, that's also known as a constant. And let's collect some terms. So we get the b to the fifth, then we get an alpha squared, then we get a t to the 5 alpha minus 2 is equal to a constant. Oh, it's equal to a constant. So that means that there can't be any time variability to this. So that means that 5 alpha minus 2 must equal 0. And so alpha must equal 2 two fifths. <gasps> We've solved for what the radius has to be. Okay, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, so we know that R goes like uh, t to the 2 fifths. Uh, dr by t is some derivative of that. That's cool. And then we can return to this formula here and calculate what b has to be. So what does b be? Okay, well, that says that b to the fifth times alpha squared, alpha is two fifths, so alpha squared is four twenty-fifths, times t to the five alpha minus two. <gasps> Why, that's uh, zero, or sorry, that's one, t to the zero. Uh, is 1 is equal to 3 e supernova over 2 pi rho naught. And so then I can solve for what b is. b is equal to b to the fifth, let's not go all in all the time, is 75 e supernova over 8 pi alpha naught. And so then b is equal to 75 e to the supernova over 8 pi alpha naught. Uh, oh, sorry. I have switched alphas. This is a row, you fool. That's a row. That's a row uh, to the one fifth. So now we've got a full expression. We know that the radius of time is going to be, as a function of time, is 75 e supernova over 8 pi rho naught to the one fifth t to the uh, Two fifths. And then the time derivative of that uh, is going to be, uh, that's going to be the same constant, uh, 75 e supernova over 8 pi rho naught to the 1 fifth times 2 fifths times t to the minus 3 halves is v. So the supernova is expanding, as we'd expect t to the two-fifths, that's an increasing function, but it's slowing down, that's t to the minus three-fifths. So it's slowing, getting bigger, but it's slowing down. Okay, so we've solved the adiabatic stage of the supernova explosion, and now we can return to what happens when the, uh, uh, the cooling kicks in. So this happens, this is beyond the scope of this class, this tends to happen when the speed reaches a characteristic speed of about 250 kilometers per second. So down from 30,000 to 250. And the density is rising, the temperature lowers to a point where cooling becomes important. And this makes the shell even thinner because the hot gas behind it presses up and makes this very narrow little bright shell that's losing a lot of radiation through lines. And so this is a edge-on view of a supernova shell that's expanding into the interstellar medium this direction, and we see this thin little shell of gas getting blown outward here. And in this case, we're no longer adiabatic. Radiation is leaving the system. So instead, what we have to do is consider this under the model that this is a momentum-conserving phase. And so we assume that this starts out at a temperature of T naught with a radius of R naught and a V naught of about 250 kilometers per second. So we basically have to use the previous solution, the set-off solution, uh, to figure out how big it is when it reaches 250 kilometers per second. Now there's my R naught and my T naught. That'll tell me when we transition to the snowplow phase. It's called snowplow because it just carries the moment. Um, the momentum carries the shell outward and gathers uh, more material. All right, so let's go ahead and solve for the time evolution of the snowplow phase. 
Uh, so we're going to assume that the momentum in the shell is conserved. So the mass of the shell times the speed of the shell is constant over time. And the mass in the shell is just going to be the density, 4 pi r cubed. So it's the volume of the shell times its speed. And that's going to be a constant that is equal to the value that it has at the beginning of the snowplow phase. And so the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to cancel out a mess of constants here. And then we're going to rewrite this as, uh, and we're going to divide both sides by whatever this constant value is, which is r naught cubed times v naught. And so we're going to say that this is uh, r cubed over v over r naught cubed over v naught is equal to 1, because it's the constant divided by itself. Uh, in that case. And then I'm going to rewrite stuff with the non-dimensionalization that r is equal to r over r naught, and then I'm going to get the little dr by dt is going to be dr over r naught by dt. Okay, and so if I do that, what I end up with is uh, this is r over r naught quantity cubed times 1 over v naught times dr over r naught dt. And if I stick a r over r naught inside there, I need one outside to cancel it. So now we're all set up to say that's equal to 1, and that's equal to r cubed times r naught over v naught times d little r by dt. Okay. That's cool. We can actually uh, start to work with this because this, my fine friends, is a separable differential equation. And so I'm going to engage in gross abuse of differential forms and multiply both sides by dt. dt is equal to, oops, come back. dt is equal to r cubed times the actual constants in the problem, v or v naught, uh, times dr. And I can integrate both of these sides. I'm going to integrate from t naught to whatever time I'm at. So t naught's where we began the snowplow phase. And then I'm going to integrate r, little r, from 1 to whatever my final radius is. And I don't necessarily need to know that, but at time t naught, little r is 1, because r equals r naught, and then I'm going to integrate it out to whatever my final radius rf is. Okay, hey, these are integrals we can do. Uh, dt just goes to t minus t naught, okay, is equal to, we'll pull the constant out front, r naught over v naught, and then we get a 1 over 4 r uh, final to the fourth minus 1 to the fourth, which is one. Okay, and now uh, I'm set. I can go ahead and solve for uh, whatever my final radius is. Let's uh, park ourselves up here and say that we have, um, let's see here, r final to the fourth minus one is equal to four v naught over r naught times t minus t naught, and then I can say that r final is equal to 1 plus 4 v naught over r naught t minus t naught to the all one fourth power. Okay, uh, and just to restore everything to its uh, proper glory, uh, we're going to remember that that r f is non-dimensionalized. It's uh, over here. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that the actual radius at the final point is r naught times 1 plus 4 v naught over r naught t minus t naught to the 1 fourth power. And if you go ahead and go through the full algebraic manipulation, you can find the speed with which it's increasing it turns out to be v naught times 1 plus 4 v naught over r naught t minus t naught to the minus three-fourths power. <gasps> well done. So this again has the property that it's getting larger, or it's going larger, r is going up like t to the one-fourth, 
uh, and the, but it's slowing down. Like uh, so, the v is dropping off like t to the minus three fourths, and that gives us what we need uh, to describe the set-off solution. So. Um, then we raise the question of what happens at the end? How does this come to a conclusion? And that happens when the speed approaches the sound speed of the ISM and is no longer supersonic. And in that case, it no longer has any uh, resistance to the other flows of gas moving around in the ISM. As a result, at that point, the external forces in the ISM will dissipate the shock waves. And this typically takes about 300,000 years for a supernova. So over that time, this supernova explosion will be washed away and mixed in with the ISM as it slows down and is no longer pushing hard into the ISM. All right. That brings us to the end of our two case studies here. We'll cover heating and cooling and the general model for ISM uh, next week. Uh, but for now, uh, have a good time and good luck on your assignments.